Hello and welcome to Waltrip Unfiltered. We have another great show today for you. We have Tyler Reddick, the young California racer who won the Xfinity race in Charlotte on Saturday in dominating fashion. We're going to talk to Tyler about how he came from Redding, California all the way to Charlotte, North Carolina and is a winner in the Xfinity series and he's a 2018 champion. A lot of people might not know that. He wasn't the favorite to do that. We'll talk to Tyler about exactly what all went into that championship season. And a big shout out to Martin Truex Jr. on his victory in the Coca-Cola 600. Did you see that wild four wide pass late in the race to get the victory? That was incredible. These 2019 cars are racing better than ever. There's never been a four wide pass on a mile and a half track to get a victory. Nearly 600 miles into that event that took place. Amazing racing. Good job, NASCAR, on the 2019 rules and the way these cars race and the fun action that I get to see. I stood on a camper in the infield and watched that race with my daughter, Macy, and all of her friends from Charlotte Country Day School. You know who went to Charlotte Country Day also? William Byron. (laughs) So the kids were having a lot of fun cheering on William. It was a great 600. It's going to be a great show today. Can't wait to bring it to you. Green play, green play. Man, I'm so glad you came by, Tyler Reddick. Thank you so much for joining me on my Waltrip Unfiltered podcast. I feel like Unfiltered, you might be the perfect guest for this uh, this show. I hope so. Um, you know, I've I've seen uh, recently on on uh, Twitter and everything how many uh, I guess you've had on here, Spencer Cole. Uh, it just looks like a really fun podcast and. I've been kind of jealous seeing all the people that have been on here, and I, I'm really glad that I finally made the cut, and I'm on the podcast with you. Well, I want to tell you, it's us racer folks that uh, have turned into TV people. We've been accused by many fans that we have a bromance for Tyler Reddick because we talk about how much fun you are to watch on the racetrack and how you like to hang your car out and you go for it. And it's just it's just refreshing to see somebody with the – was just set on go every lap there on the racetrack. Yeah, you know, sometimes that that falls to my uh, disadvantage at times. Um, I guess more so, I should say, last year. You know, uh, I was pretty much set to to kill every single lap, and I'd kill it about every single race somewhere (laughs) along the way. Uh, So I just had to get smarter along the way. Uh, I think when we got put in that spot at the end of the year, uh, before the playoffs started, I, I guess the end of summer, I should say, last year, we were just terrible. Everything's going bad. It's like, well, we're not even going to make it through the first round. We're we're going to be the we're going to be the last car in, in this playoff standings. First one out, and you know, me and Dave Allen sat down, and somehow we f- found out something that made sense to me, and you know, I changed my mind outlook a little bit, and we attacked it race by race, and I've just tried to keep that ever since. You know, I, picture. It's funny you say that because I saw you after the race in Charlotte last May. And I think you'd been in the wall a couple times and finished 23rd, I think, somewhere outside the top 20. And, and, and after the race, you're like, that's just who I am, man. I go, and I'm going to go. And, and you walked off, and I thought, I love his spirit. But, but sometimes in order to, to, to go, you got to be pulled back a bit. And what, what a, everybody knows what a genius Dave Ellens is. And, and the, 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 the fact that you were able to learn those lessons in such a quick period of time uh, and then go on to win the championship. That's impressive. Well, I it seemed quick to me yeah. from from Mar, Mar or it seemed quick to me from May when you had that attitude yes. to to go into Miami and win in a championship. Well, I hit the wall pretty early on in that race, and it was pretty warm. So I think it may have been a little delusional when I did my <laughs> uh, my interview. I looked really hot. I when I still had the beard, and I just looked like I was about to pass out. Yeah, I was thinking back to that race, and I forgot I'd ran as good as I did, but I remember hitting as many things as I did. And I mean, just like you said, I was running. I think two laps down, we're, we're out of the race, we just need to limp it home, and I drive into one and two on the last lap. Me thinking I'm taking it easy, but me still doing the things that, that I did most of the summer, I just drove it in too hard and lost it. Two laps down and wrecked like two or three other cars. I wrecked the 60, who already had a bad day, so I killed another one of their cars. I, uh, I think Jeremy Clements got in it, like some other people, some lower budget teams. On the last lap, that had nothing, I mean, meant nothing for us at that point. So yeah. it's, it's been tough to kind of go back and watch those races. But it's been good, painfully reminding uh, messages hidden without all those races of, okay, yep, there's another race that I did what I shouldn't have done. And it's been rough to watch them, um, but it's taught me good lessons going back and watching those races as the year's gone on. Well, let's just let's just hop forward one year from, from last May when we had that conversation post-race to 
a victory at Charlotte Motor Speedway, the, the place that most NASCAR drivers would, would put in their top two or three of places they would want to win. And uh, you did it in convincing fashion. So congratulations on your big win. Thank you. You know, it's a place that me, going when we were coming back after Dover and we had those two weeks off or ran at Kansas, I've had such a rough history at Charlotte that I forget that it's a mile and a half. And I don't know if it's just the way it races or it's just the different, way it's different, right? Of, it is definitely different. I mean, the corner entry and exit, they're different. Uh, they're a lot harder than your typical mile and a half that we've we've been to. There's smooth transitions. It's not as rough. The corners are more, you know, symmetrical. So I I'd, I'd all but forgotten Charlotte was a mile and a half. And I think part of that was because and as I found out when I went back and watched how rough my last two races had kind of gone there. But uh to roll in there, you know, thinking that man, I I hope we just run top 10 to working hard and the guys at the shop working hard on our cars on the off weekends to bring me a really good piece for Charlotte to unloading on Thursday and having the fast slap on with a, with a car in a balance in that first run that I thought, man, this isn't very good. And it was like, well, we're, we're pretty quick. Then in second practice, we made it even better. And it was, you know, the only car in the 29s and had really, really good five, 10, 15. And yeah. You had all those categories. Yeah. When I logged out of that garage on Thursday night, I was terrified that I was scared. To, I was joking around. I was scared to cross the street. I'm looking four ways every single time I pull out in front of anybody on the on the highway. Like I said, to make sure I got back to the track Saturday morning and hop in that thing for qualifying. I have, I have an interesting question. I think did you ever think from Thursday till Saturday, all right, don't screw this up, or or was it just all confidence that you know if I when I get there I'm gonna win this damn race? No, I was definitely terrified I was gonna screw it up somewhere along yeah. the way. You don't get That's a cars. Racer. Yeah, you. I think I've only walked away from the racetrack one other time feeling that good about a race car uh, in my entire asphalt career, and that was at Kentucky. Uh, and it wasn't even as good as, as our car in Charlotte was in practice. And walking away from that race in Kentucky was the same thing. I was like, man, I, <laughs> I just You gotta, knew it, huh? I knew it. It was hard to sleep. And, you know, when we practice on Thursday and you're off all day Friday, you have to just sit there and think about, all right, how do I not screw this up? And you're just worried what like what could happen, what could change. Um, and, you know, we, we're not perfect when we load in on the race. We're a little bit loose. But where I feel like Tyler last year would have gotten in trouble and pushed it too hard, mm-hmm. probably put it in the fence in that opening stage or two when the balance wasn't right, I knew that I just had to be smart and ride and take care of it and get get to pit road and get to my guys, and we were going to adjust on it and make it better. Well, cheers. It was an Thank awesome you. victory. Actually, speaking of cheers... I figured I'd bring by some twisted teas and we oh, could have nice. a little bit of a toast. Yeah, so, that's a great idea. Yeah. I drank way too many of these uh in Victory Lane. So post race interview, you got to uh you got to the media center where you're already feeling it pretty good? Well, I <laughs> I felt pretty good, honestly. When I got out of the car after the race. And I was uh, real quick, um I think of Jimmy Johnson and Ricky Stenhouse and, and all these guys that are just fitness fanatics and your name quite honestly doesn't hop up to the top of that yeah. list for me i know you're a young man and you're in great shape but um how were you confident that you were ready for that fierce heat oh, we yeah. had saturday afternoon no i i what was crazy is i think some of it was i kept the car out of the wall i didn't yeah. the crush panels out of it uh but i honestly felt you know on thursday in practice i felt really good i didn't even really get that hot i mean it was it was not as warm as it's going to be on saturday but the majority of that race, everyone kept asking me how, how I felt in the heat, how I felt in the heat. And I'm like, man, these AC units working good. I'm I'm sweating a little bit, but I've sweat a lot more, you know, years prior at some races. I knew how hot it was, but I felt really good. And honestly, when I got out of the car, I felt great. Um, you know, my adrenaline got pumping. Uh, I started getting handed twisted teas like crazy, and I just started drinking them really fast. <laughs> uh, before I knew it, four were gone, and then all of a sudden, I think I just drank way too much sugar and alcohol, and it all just hit my stomach. And I was like, oh, gosh, I don't want to get yeah. sick. And uh, – my friends behind me will tell you they thought I was going to get sick. Uh, so, you know. Come on, team. <laughs> so hopefully, you know, no one really thought, man, he just fell out of the seat and he just got lucky. No, I, I felt really good most of the race. Right. I just uh, probably should have a little bit more water in between Twisted T's and Victory Yeah, Lines. it's important to, to take care of your sponsors, though. And you, your sponsor was, uh, on the race car at Charlotte was Tame the Beast. Yes. And you and were a beast, and you tamed Charlotte, so that was so fitting. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I somewhat forgot the nickname Charlotte has, uh, the Beast in the Southeast, right? Um, but it's, it's really cool that they came on. Uh, their first race was Kansas uh, two, three weeks ago now. Uh, we ran, ran it, uh, the cup start over there. Right. Uh, the night race, and 
That was awesome. That car looked really good under the lights. I actually think it looked even better in the in the heat of the day in the sun up by the fence of Charlotte. Um, but it was a cool opportunity for them to step in and their first race be be at Kansas on a cup car, and then we hop right back into the mix in the Xfinity side. We go to victory lane with them. So yeah. it's you, been cool to have them come on. You used to be a hairy man. You had yeah. A beard and and uh, so they've are they. I mean, I don't want to get too personal, but have they cleaned you up a bit here and there? Well, you know, I use all their products for just about everything. Uh, they got, they call it shaving cream, but it's kind of like an oily, mm-hmm. I wouldn't say a butter, but it's not like a foam cream. Works really good for keeping my face sheen, clean shaved. Uh, they got face lotions. They've got soft and hard uh, hair pomades that work really, really good. Uh, their, stop, their gel pomade, almost, you don't even need hairspray. Once it sets, it, it sets pretty hard. Their clay pomade works good. Um, probably my, one of my favorite things though is their yop and they got, uh, it's a three in one. It's for your hair, it's for your beard and it's for the rest of your body. Um, but it, I don't know. I probably sound like a salesman when I say it, but foams up really good in the hair, but when you use it on your body, it doesn't foam up like shampoo. It's, it doesn't make sense to me, but you know, it's got a little bit of like menthol yop. and yop. It's what they call it. Yeah. Mm. It's got a little bit of menthol in it. So it has that, like, makes you feel kind of that tingly fresh when it's right. done. Smells really good. Um, so it's crazy, you know, we, they came over to the shop, and I got to meet all the guys um, and get to know some of their stuff, and they gave me some product. And honestly, it, with even if we would have partnered with them or not, I was, gonna, I, was, I was sold. Yeah. They got a customer. It, it was really good stuff. And ever since I got the stuff from them, I've been using all their stuff ever since. And yeah. I love it. Was, are, you, are you like a hairy man? Is your back all No, hairy? I, yeah. I, I'm no, I don't have a hairy back. Uh, a friend of my family's, Buzz, Man, if he when he didn't wear a shirt, he looked like a bear. He has so much hair on his back. So I'm sure you could use some of that stuff back there you for need, him. You need to call Buzz and say, I got something for you, brother. Yeah, I probably should. I probably should send some, some stuff his way. He'd probably love it. That's awesome. Well, um, Charlotte was incredible. Kansas, I thought, was equally as impressive, being able to to race inside the top ten. And And you know what I love, Tyler? It's just so different. It's different now racing at Kansas than it was – Ever before. So, you know, I would go there, and I, I think I did pretty good there a couple times. But it was it was a mile-and-a-half race, and you're, you know, you're too wide every now and then. You're mainly by yourself. I mean, those late restarts, you're four wide. Absolutely. I mean, how do you, how do you as, a, as, a, as a kid, basically hopping in the, the grown-up pool, how, how do you have the confidence to drive in there with those guys um, late in the race and, and grab yourself a top ten? Well, uh, quite honestly, I th- you know we we got a little lucky with the, the caution falling our way. I think we could have realistically if we had the perfect day, ran inside the top ten. Uh, we just had a couple. I just chose the wrong lane a couple times on restarts, not knowing how the cars race and react. Um, you know, just a couple hiccups along the way kind of kept us from being in the, real close to the top ten most of the day. We were getting our way there, and you know the caution kind of helped us. But once we got up there with some of those guys and we cycled out third, fourth on that one restart, I thought we were we were pretty good. We just you know. We attacked the race a little bit one way, and I think we should have been just a little bit more focused on speed by the end of that night. But it made us re- it made us work really good on restarts. But you know, as you were saying, going on there toe to toe with those guys, you know, when you get to race against Harvick, you know, Kyle Busch, Brad Keselowski, Joey Logano, and go toe to toe with them, guys that are, you know, champions. Yes, I have no problem sticking in there with the rest of them. Uh, you know, if I can go to toe to toe with some of the best that that there is in the Xfinity series, so. You know, getting to run against those guys in trucks, Xfinity is probably the only only way and reason that I was able to hop in it like I did and just go after it because I know I've been able to do it just in other yeah. series. But if reading your bio, uh, since since you were four years old, you got an outlaw carts and and I, I read where you said we really never did stick around long in any one series, just jumped yeah. up and right right into the, the the action and that that type of of background that that has that had to help in Kansas that night, knowing that you've done this before and it's just time to do it again. Yeah. You know, I think, I think back to my young days when I ran outlaw carts and we were really, really fast in like the box stocks and lower divisions. And, you know, we didn't stick around in them too long, but we were, we played around with running three and four divisions and, you know, the, the two or the three that I would run, I would just smoke them. And then the, the only real challenge was the opens. And, you know, I almost, it almost got to the point where it was bad that I was, just hopping in, I just expected to win all the time because that's not how it works. Yeah, and I quickly learned that when I when we finally moved up and we're moving up pretty quickly through like mini sprints and then non wing sprint cars and then into late models. I lasted there for five years, and that's, those five years of just getting beaten to the ground, getting just stomped on by veterans that have done it for longer than you've been alive was tough, and it it almost destroyed my confidence. 
Um, but when I finally got the opportunity to get back into like stock cars or get into stock cars for the first time, um, it made me really appreciate, you know, when you get an opportunity, you have to take advantage of it after having, you know, we'd, we'd be fast at times in, in those dirt cars and in late models and have some good shots, win big races, but never caught a good break. And looking back, you know, I thought that may have been a bad thing getting stomped on, you know, people saying, ah, he's not that good. Right. He doesn't look great, you know? Um, but when I finally got those really, really big opportunities, I would, when I got into stock racing, I didn't let them slide. So you mentioned outlaw carts at the age of four and a half. Uh, did, you raced against Kyle Larson out in California, right? Um, you know, I'd say at first, not too much, but like probably the the seven to six, seven, maybe to the 10-ish window. We raced against each other quite a bit and open intermediates. Um, That's so crazy for me to listen to. I didn't know you open. could. I didn't. When I was a kid, you couldn't race when you were that young. I know. We uh, <laughs> a friend of mine, Casey McLean, he even started racing a year younger than me. He was at he was like three and a half. But you know, the beginner box stocks are really really safe. You know, when you're that little in, a, in an outlaw cart, it's actually really big. I mean, when you're when you're you know, yeah. itty little bitty. And I was a small kid too, so I felt pretty safe in those cars. Uh, but when you're that young, running that stuff, I mean, they're they're fast. Um, and they're fun, but I thought they were really safe. And, you know, the place we would race at were, were just good places. We had a lot of really good tracks around us. I lived in Corning most of my childhood, uh, I guess, before 10 years old in California. We got to race at Red Bluff, uh, Cycleland. We go up to Lakeport sometimes. And uh, we got opportunity to travel around California a little bit on the All-Star Tour. I think they had one for one or two years. But, you know, they're fun cars. They're safe. Um, but the rate of progression you would go throughout, you know, the classes they had was just outstanding. And it it's responsible for who i am today it's it taught me how to race right on and kyle larson got back in an outlaw cart this weekend over yeah. at millbridge you ever go over there and mess around uh you know i haven't in a couple years i go over there and watch every now and again my crew chief randall burnett his brother um you know runs that place they're doing a really good job oh really it. yes jason or, or jeremy sorry Jer- jeremy burnett burnett um but my last time i'd say i really drove there i was it was on non-wing night and i was racing against adam welch a friend of mine uh, I was in Kyle. I think I was in Kyle Beatty's go kart, and his right rear tire came off in front of me. It was an only night, so they drive a little bit different. It's, it's a little bit more fun, I think. And when his tire came off, I hit it, his right rear tire, and it sent me clear over the fence, off out of turn two, out into the woods. And and you were out in the woods by yourself when you landed. Well, I caught one of the fence posts behind the fence, and I was hanging upside down. I'm like, well, oh, that was really crazy. And then I'm la- laying on laying like upside down ish. I don't know where I'm even at because it was it happened so fast. Right. Um, but there's a – one of the fence posts went through the front bumper and was holding the cart up. Wow. And when I got out, they said, don't unbuckle. And I looked down, and it's like a 15-foot drop behind the racetrack. And I'm just dangling on this post That's outside crazy. the racetrack. I'm like, how the heck did this just happen? So they had to rip me out of this cart. We got it fixed went back out and raced it the rest of the night. But, man, it was crazy. I've never really had too many wrecks that, like, kind of – whoa. But that one kind of did because it, it about ripped both my legs off. If, yeah. if my legs would have been up in the air a little bit more, that, pen, that post would have went – through my legs, I actually ripped my suit that I had on at the time. Uh, but it was kind of a crazy wreck. Um, I wouldn't say it kept me from getting back in it, but, you know, I just, I've wanted to race them some more, but I, I just haven't taken the time or set aside the money for myself to go get a cart and do it right, right from the ground up again. Well, you got a lot of other stuff to do. Come well, on. and that's what I found, you know, as I've come over here, the more I've been in it, the more you can insert yourself into certain things that you probably don't have to, but it's good to be around for them. It's good to be at the shop every day. If I wasn't at the shop every day, I probably could be out there racing like Christopher Bell is. But, you know, I think his guys have the confidence in him to – he can go out and do that. He's been doing it. He's known to do it. Um, I think my guys would trust me, and they're – you know, uh, Randall and some of my guys on my team are dirt racers, know my background. But um, I've almost found that's maybe a little bit more important right now. As much fun as it would be to, Mm -hmm. you know, get versatile, run some dirt races – it's very important to spend as much time up there with the guys that are working on that, those cars from morning to afternoon every single day. When I was a kid, I was obviously uh, my brother, Daryl, was the reason why I wanted to be a racer. It, it's all I knew. He's 16 years older than me, so I've told that story on this podcast so people at home are tired of hearing it. So I'm just going to tell you that's the reason why I wanted to race. I read your grandpa was, was your the first exposure you had to wanting to race. He was racing old sprint cars without... Any roll cages, just just enjoying racing? Well, I wouldn't – I would say my grandfather or my dad are kind of – I mean, they're both very equally involved in how I got into racing. What my grandfather's racing outlaw, the you know, the true outlaw, like sprint cars without the cage, way back when, well before I was ever here. Right. Um, that would have been more when my mom was, was three or four years old watching him race. I think I believe it was at Shasta when it was still dirt. 
Um, but he had a really bad wreck one time, and my grandmother at the time said, all right, you know, you scared the daylights out of me. They didn't know he was okay for like three or four minutes. And he's like, you got to pick the sprint car or me. And he sold the sprint car, got rid of it, picked family over, over racing. Um, so that was the end of that story. I was never there for it. My mom got to see it, she, you know, that kind of stuff. But, you know, tons of years later, my dad would race on the side. Uh, he would work with my mom and my grandfather at his dealership. And on the weekends, he had a, he had a dirt and a, a dirt slash asphalt modified that he would kind of take and race. And the first places I was really exposed to racing was that same track, Shasta, but this time it was asphalt. Um, and I don't know. I was so young. I don't remember everything. My mom just – and my mom and my dad just saw it. My dad, wouldn't, when he'd be in the race car, my mom would watch me. And she could just see something, just an absurd amount of interest in racing that she doesn't really see that often in kids. And it went, be, it went deeper than that. When I was at the dealership when my parents were working before I was old to go to school, I was running around playing with – just – in awe with all the cars. Right. I think cars and racing, cars got me into racing, and racing is what made me stick around. And um, before I ever made my start, you know, playing nothing but racing games, it couldn't get me off of that. Just loving big wheels, anything with wheels, right. and that's that's what started it all. That's, that's awesome. What's kept me here. And then it came from California to North Carolina. Now you're driving for Richard Childress Racing, and uh, there's a lot of folks in the garage area that say that's a perfect fit, Tyler and Richard Childress Racing. What have you learned or seen from Richard that that makes you? as confident and, and, and as good as you've been this year? Well, it's, you know, I've had the opportunity to work for two guys that I feel like their their bread and butter, their way to make their living is racing, and that was Chip Ganassi, and he's obviously got way more than just NASCAR, um, but he makes his living through racing, so I think a lot of his employees, you know, are racers too. And when I when I went to Richard Childress Racing, I felt the same way. Uh, you got a lot of really, really cool people throughout history that, They've done incredible things that work there. You know, we got Petrie there. You know, we got Danny Lawrence. We got Chocolate. We got the characters. Uh, and, and Richard, of course, as well, right. spearing it all. And just a, an unreal group of guys. A lot of people over there are diehard racers. Um, so when I stepped into that building, you know, after I won the championship, you know, I just <clears> – <throat> I didn't know what to expect. But the excitement and the, you know, the the morality when I walked into the building and how excited people were to have me there – how excited Danny Stockman was to have me, you know, Luke Lambert, the other crew chiefs, Andy Petrie, everyone was really pumped to have me come in. And that got me even more fired up than I already was going in there and just being around there all, all the time up there at the shop with the guys, you know, they're they're paying attention to what's going on. They love seeing how well we're running. They're constantly telling me, good job, well, just keep it up. Like, we'll, we'll keep feeding it to you if you keep delivering it for us. So before I even – got to Christmas or whatever it was, I was more pumped up than I was, you know, just coming off the championship because yeah. I could just feel the, you know, their, their levels, the energy was high and they were excited to have me and it got me fired up going into this year. It almost seemed like in 2018, people had already put in Christopher Bell's name on the championship. I mean, when I knew, Chris, I know Christopher's a really good race car driver and it, we, we saw what he did at Kansas and that's just, that's just what he's capable of. And so going into that season, we all knew he was going to be really, really good. And I think, a lot of people, even myself almost at one point, I just thought, man, it's his. He's got it. And, yeah, it, it didn't end up going that way. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and so when – when I'll, I'll say that to say that when the when you won the championship, you almost felt like people didn't appreciate it or thought you, you lucked into it somehow or another, and you don't – that's obviously crazy talk. But how rewarding was it to be able to, 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 to deliver something that no one – really, I don't think, thought you were going to be capable of in 2018. Yeah, it's crazy. You know, we, we started the year off so well that I, I almost feel like we started the year off too well. Winning that one race, we, I just kind of had this mentality that and it was wrong by all means. We win the race, all right, we're in the playoffs, we can be smart. You know, I can be really aggressive, and if we wreck, we wreck, whatever. But I want to try and go and win races, and well, you got to finish the race to win them. You got to have a car left at the end of the race if you want to win them. And I wasn't really leaving ourselves the opportunity to do that. And so, you know, as the year dragged on, I what kept me going was just Homestead. From the moment we walked into that season uh, with Dave and the nine team, I told him just give me to Homestead, just give me to Homestead. I know, we, I know, we got a lot do. of work to get to Homestead, and it's though. a lot of work to get to Homestead. And we almost, you know, we almost didn't even get there. We forgot about getting there. It's almost harder than than being there. Right. Um, but we had our test in August, I would say, and this is in the middle of our kind of our slump, right? Uh, our slump pretty much started from Daytona on, almost it feels like. But you know, I ran three hundred and sixty something laps, and I think all but maybe forty of those laps were on the all but forty of those laps um, 
you know, were on the fence. Yeah. I was working the fence in. I could see as our two-day test went on, Christopher was there. Was, Christopher was there, I think. Uh, Austin Sendrick was there. And then uh, Todd Gillen was there in the truck, I believe. And everybody had worked in this groove. You could see where the rubber was laying down. One car licked off the wall, and then the rest of the track at the top. It was just like hit light, just a little bit lighter. That's where I was running. That's where everyone else was running. And, you know, we bounced off the wall. We hit it. We did this and that. But I spent my entire time up there trying to get the car to work good there. But not only that, but, no, every every single thing that I needed to do on that fence because I felt like that's – you know, I knew what we had speed-wise even if we, we did have a good race. And I knew it was really hard to keep up with straight up with the double zero, the 20 – and even the 21 at times. So I knew I was going to have to do something different. And, you know, once I found what we needed in that car in our race, I was able to go up to the fence and just just make it work. I'd, I knocked the wall down all fun. year long, and uh, I got all the bugs worked out from, you know, February to, to the week before Homestead, and then I took care of the rest from there. And I want to tell you, I was, I was like a lot of other people late in that race. I'm like, slow down. <laughs> Move over. We got this. We yeah. can't afford hitting that wall. Well, you know, that's the funny thing, and, I, I I feel like when I went back and watched that race, there was one time I got in the fence that I think the TV didn't catch it, and that was the one lap I tried to give myself probably another two or three inches or four. And when I did, you know, I just – it upset the the balance, the little cushion I had built up there, and I just drove in the corner a little bit easier away from the fence and then just drove right in the fence. So I'm like, okay, I better just stay on the wall but just go really, really, really slow, and it worked out. Like I, I almost felt that way at Charlotte. I didn't want to get too far away from the wall at the end of that race because I knew that if I did, I may have gotten a push yeah. in – you know, the grip may just not have been the same. So, you know, for me, when everyone's screaming, get off the wall, get off the wall, what are you doing? It's, I'm, I'm happy. I'm running about 50% up there, just cruising. I know where the wall is. I'm not going to hit it. I'm just running up by it. So I don't, if I do have a mistake or an issue, I don't hit it that hard. And that's, that's the one thing that's great about the wall. If you run this far off of it, if you think you're about to cut a tire or something's about to go wrong, there's nothing worse. I, it drives me insane. People are like, oh, I hit the wall, I hit the wall. And then they run the bottom of the next lap and they blow the tire and hit it with a huge head of steam. It's like, no, what are you doing? If you think you're going to blow a tire, ride the fence, you won't hit it that hard. You'll be able to fix it and get back out there. So that was kind of my mentality about it is, yeah, you can scrape it. You don't want to get stuck on it. Um, but if you run right next to it, you don't hit it that hard. Yeah, well, it's been a, a fun start to the to the 2019 season. Eight top fives in a row. That's the longest ever, right, for you? Yeah, I've I've not had any consistency anywhere near that. And the craziest part is, you know, Las Vegas going for the win. Uh, you know, coming to the white flag underneath Kyle Bush, I get loose and wreck. If you take that out of the picture, I think we'd be at um, 10. 10, I think, yeah. I mean, that's just insane. Yeah. Um, you right. know, it's a shame we wrecked there, but I would much rather give away that streak of top 10s going for that win every single time. Um, but between that, I think we still scored stage points in every single stage so far this year. Wow. I mean, we've just we've just been doing it right, and and, you know, I think a lot of that, is falling to me just a little bit more experience, getting smarter, know when to push, when to not, but also having fantastic race cars uh, has made that more possible too. I like to play a little game on my podcast. It's it's the top three moments of Tyler Reddick's career. I want to tell you my top three, and then you tell me yours. And yours are probably going to go back to when you were four and a half years old, no, no, not look at, <laughs> looking at pictures of your grandpa in his in his sprint car without any roll cage on it. I don't know exactly where you start, but my my first favorite moment um, was your championship drive at Homestead. We just talked about how you ran the wall, how you did everything perfect. And, and I think I told some of my buddies, like, you better watch Tyler because he's, this is his game. This is where he'll be, he'll be the man at. And, and just to see you, uh, put the competition in your rear view mirror and then like you close it out running right on the wall. That to me, that was my, one of my three favorite moments. I'm going to number it. Number three. Um, second was your 2018 Daytona win where you were able to, um, beat Elliot Sadler in the closest finish ever in a NASCAR race. I know. You know, and the coolest thing about winning the closest, the coolest thing about the closest finish ever in NASCAR is winning it for you. And it's got to piss Elliot Sadler off. I mean, he, he got beat in the closest finish he, ever. He, he lost by less than anyone ever had. He there, I think. Um, I think in the the next race of July, I think to uh, Kyle Larson yes. when the caution came out, he yes. ended up just barely losing it. I feel so bad for him. Like, there's that's got to feel horrible. I, I you see that highlight, uh, and you're like, that's the best ever. And he sees it, and he says, that's the worst ever. I know. I can only imagine, but you know. That's that's how racing goes. Yeah. I mean, that's 
I'm somewhere along those lines. I'm going to have that moment. I think I've. I think I've had them, but I think I just choose to forget them, and I've been fortunate <laughs> enough to that they don't show replays and highlights on TV all the time. But that it's coming. I mean, you have high moments, you have low moments. That's just part of racing for sure. Now, my favorite Tyler Reddick career moment was at Talladega, and and you got the win. Yes, sure. But my favorite moment was the the blocking, the the driving you did at the end. You came down the straightaway and whipped from the top to the bottom and left black marks. You left black marks going down the straightaway at Talladega. That's how aggressively you were driving. And to me, that, that was thrilling. It was a blast. Um, you know, I, I had a really good race car that weekend. It's the car we had at Daytona, and it was so fast. I mean, it, we, we dang near got the pull again at Talladega with the same car. And when we go back to Daytona, we're going to have it again. We just have to put our new right side on it because I ripped it off. But that car was so good at, at, at the first race. And I knew going into Talladega, I had a really good car once again since we kept it in one piece. Um, but man, when I, you know, we had, me and Ross had an issue on pit road, you know, colleague is a satellite team and we share a lot of information technically speaking. And they had, they had an issue with their, with their pit road speed. Ross thought he was running his lights. He thought he was where he's supposed to be. And when in reality, he's pushing me down pit road, I'm like trying to hold the brake, like slow him down. And we both speed. So we have to go to the back. And I wasn't really mad at him, but he thought I was frustrated with him. I was just trying to mess with him and play around with him because he thought I was mad at him. I was just trying to get to his outside when it was a single file. I mean, if there, if you leave me three quarters of a car, I'm going to try and put it up there. And uh, going at the end of the the trial yeah. there, I just got really tight, and he kind of got tight. We somehow just I got air on the right spot on him, and it, it forced him to have when we kind of drug each other out. And when I did, I hit the one spot I think in three miles of wall that there is around the top of that racetrack that's got like a metal plate. I think there's a gate there. Uh-huh. If it had been just a regular spot in the wall, no big deal, a little brush, no big deal. But I hit this plate that sticks out about that far. It's a big, solid piece of metal. And it just destroyed the whole right side of our car. Ripped holes in it. I mean, destroyed it. And we're running single file. And I just hit the wall, and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. I didn't just do that. I've taken the best car, in, in my opinion, here this weekend, and I just ruined this moment to win a race. A race that we should have won, or and we I'm, could win. And by the way, I was going down a straightaway. And by the, Yes. <laughs> by the way, we're single file at Talladega. The easiest place to ride in a line, you would think, single file. And I just drove it in the wall by myself. So that put this ridiculous amount of pressure on myself. You know, I have to win this race. And it continued to just compound from there because we came in to fix it. We, uh, we couldn't get it fixed. And when, in the process of fixing it, we had a jack stand under the car and that got took stuck that with you, right? all the way around the racetrack. So we just kept making it worse and worse. We were literally two and a half laps, maybe one, from going a lap down. And a caution comes out and we get saved. And at that point, once I get back on lead lap, I'm like, all right. I literally have to win this race because for me to do what I've done already at this point, take us out of it, I, I, I mean, I told myself it's <laughs> live or die situation. Like, I have to win this race. And I've lost that race in the last lap before to Spencer Gallagher the year before. Mm-hmm. And when we got to that last lap, I, I was quite all right with wrecking the whole field if I had to. I wasn't going to let someone get by me again. You could tell. The last time it happened, it was, it was, it was gut-wrenching. You know, it was, we were getting ready to have the struggle that we had from that point on the rest of the year, and you just can't let an opportunity like that slip away. And that's just the mentality I had then and the mentality I have and I try to have all the time. All right, you tell me your top three Tyler Reddick career. Why is that hard for me to say? What are your top three moments of your career, your young career, if you will? Um, you know, I'd say... A, it, it pretty it pretty well mirrors what you've what you've got. Oh, cool. Um, but I'll try and mix it up a little bit since we've already talked about it. Um, you know, I guess I'll try and start with three, but um, it's hard not to throw the championship in there. But <clears throat> since we already talked about those three, I'll try and mix it up. But I felt like when uh, I met Ken Schrader racing dirt late models, um, we got to know each other. We got to race against each other. It opened up the door for us to race in ARCA and in K&N together with each other. Uh, and the ARC races went okay. Uh, I was had a lot of learning to do. It was my first ever asphalt race. The first two were at Mobile and, and Salem. And we did pretty good at Salem, but I struggled at Mobile. I just had no idea what I was doing. Asphalt was just a foreign like a foreign country to and me. And you were Never 16? I think I was 16 or 17. But honestly, that's the best part. I can't remember how old I was. Uh, what I'm getting to is Rockingham in the K&N series. <laughs> my first K&N start, I think it was the team, Schrader's first start as a team in the K&N series. We had some old Dodge body. I think everyone was pretty much racing Fords and Chevys and Toyotas at the time. We were like one of the only Dodges, and we were like an 08 Dodge, and we're in like 2013 or 14. That's what a branding on our car was. 
Um, and we go into that race. We run really good. And, you know, last lap battle with Brett Moffitt, he comes to block, and I'm there. Like, this is my first ever race. I didn't know what he was racing for. I knew some of the players in there. Larson was in there. I knew some of the drivers. Was but I didn't. Corey LaJoy in that race, too? Corey was right behind me, yeah. I mean, there's – so that's what I'm getting to. Uh, you know, I Brett makes a block. We wreck. Oh, he wrecks. I, I go on to win, finish the race and win. Um, and that's my first start. No one knows who I am. Who I, who I am? What, what am I doing here? Where'd you come from? <laughs> so it was just crazy. But as time go, has gone on, uh, I'd say about a year ago, I went back and looked at the results sheet. There were so many big players that are in NASCAR that were in that race. You know, Bubba Walsh was in there. Corey LaJoy was in there. Kyle Larson was in there. Chase Elliott. Brett Moffitt, um, you said. Brett Moffitt. Ryan Gifford, he, he works at the shop on, on my cars now. There were so many really, really good drivers at the time, and I, I knew nothing when I, I was getting into it, so I, I didn't know who anybody was. Yeah. But that was probably one of my favorite moments. Um, another one for me, it's, it's a highlight, but it's also you know sad. But <clears throat> when I was racing Dirt Late Models, the first time I sat on the front row at the World 100 was really special for me. Uh, we ended up going six laps, and we had a failure, and we were done in the feature, but came from sixth place in that feature. It was my first year racing there. I had to wait till I was 16 to race there. And I came from six on a late race heat, re- heat race restart. The seas just kind of opened up. It looked like I just drove, drove my tail off. But the, the, the right things happened at the right time. And I got to, the, got to the lead and won that heat race. And it was my second uh, start at Eldora. And I got out of that car. And, I mean, people were just going nuts in the stands all the way around, the, around Eldora. Because, you know, they'd seen me race, but they hadn't seen me race there. And I, I somehow won the seat race. And I was starting on the pole at, at the feature there, and it was just the youngest experience. The youngest ever. That was part of yeah. my list of things that you did. Yeah. Was the youngest was pole at yeah. the World 100. It was unfortunately, you know, a moment that we, we went in that race. We had a failure, and it didn't go well. My next race there, kind of the same thing, but we went longer this time. We were leading 30 laps in, and we blew a motor. But, um, you know, those were tough. But, you know, number one, I'd say if I, if I have to go back, uh, you know, would probably just be the, the – the process and how we got to Homestead. I know we already talked about it, but it was such a rough path. We were yeah. basic. We, we, I think the first round, we barely made it by like six or seven points. At one point we were out, you know, the next round, it was kind of the same thing. And then the final round of Phoenix was one of the most stressful moments of my life. Cause Justin Allgaier was, was mad on a, on a, on a rampage trying to get back in there and things just kind of broke and happened right in front of me. And he got collected in a wreck and we barely squeezed into Homestead. But probably one of my favorite weeks of my life was going into Homestead, knowing that, no one thinks you're going to do it. You know you can do it. And we've been planning on doing it all year long if we just got there. And, um, you know, normally you're so stressed out in those moments. But I just felt really good. I knew I had nothing to lose going into that race. And if I wrecked trying to win it, that's okay because I'd done that all year long already. So no one was expecting anything different. But um, just that whole journey last year, how up and down it was, yeah. it was really rewarding to top it off that way. Um, just one quick question would you would you rather be standing by a car in victory lane that looked like your one at talladega did or the one at charlotte did that's tough um i'm going for talladega yeah i would say so because (laughs) i mean i mean look at martin truex's race last night yeah i watched him blow that tire and hit the fence as hard as he did i'm like wow you know all the gibbs cars are having weird tire failures yeah and to watch him go out there, hit that fence. Now he's got the crush panels knocked out. Doesn't have the best aerodynamics. They don't have flange fit bodies. And then still come back and win that race. I mean, when you have up and down days like that, like we did at Talladega or, you know, races that just go that way and you still come out and win them. I mean, Homestead, we bounced off the wall, but we were we were the worst car of the four and running ninth at one time. And I had to go past all of them on the last run. Runs like that where you have to come from behind or laps down and you come back and still win. It's like the biggest sigh of relief and the biggest, most rewarding feeling I think there is. I mean, it's fun to just go out and dominate a race, but when you know you, you have a race that potentially gets taken away from you and you still just, no, I'm taking it back. Yeah. There's nothing better than that. So the thing about the Truex win in the 600, I know you know, but I don't think fans at home have an understanding that if they had to put two pounds of air in, the, in those tires just to keep them from blowing out, that dramatically changes the yes. way the car handles, and it's going to push. There, you, bad air, it's going to be it's going to be tight. And Cole Pern was able to make adjustments and and overcome having to add air into their tires and still get that victory. That was pretty impressive. It was. I mean, those guys. I mean, they've hit Cole and, and Martin have got definitely got one of those connections that. I mean, they just make it work. 
you know, there's some races when they flat dominate, you drop the green, like we've seen in years prior at the 600 when they lead 300. He was on his way to doing that. Yeah, he was. Absolutely. Sunday night because yeah. he drove to the front and was gone. Yeah. He hit the wall. So the, the 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 Coke 600 was a great race. People loved it, and it was very entertaining for me. I stood on a camper in the infield and watched it with my daughter, which that made it more special for me yet. But um, it was getting ready to be another one of those 2016 performances yeah. from Truex, it looked like. Yeah, I mean, it, it, as easy as they make it look sometimes, <laughs> it is not easy. You know how they, hard it is. They work really hard, and they did a lot of great things over there at the 78. And I knew once they found it over there at, at Gibbs – they were going to be really tough once again, and, and they're showing it right now for sure. No doubt. All right, I'm going to continue my games. Your top three drivers of all time. I'll tell you mine real quick, just so you know sort of how I came about them. They are Daryl Waltrip, Dale Earnhardt, and Richard Petty. And yeah. it's it's interesting because those are three heroes of the sport. One of them's my brother, and I, I grew up not really knowing him that well at all because when I was born, he was 16. He was off to the races. I never really saw him. When I went south, I, I moved in with Richard Petty. I was friends with Kyle, and he said, Dad, I'll let you stay over there until you figure out what you're going to do. And I lived with Richard Petty and got you know career advice and direction from Richard Petty. And then Dale Earnhardt was my buddy. And uh, we, we always said as, you know, as, as friends, you drive for me one day, you'll win. And, and I got the opportunity uh, to drive for Dale and, and just, just, just my a dear friend mainly, but, but a, a guy that, that I always – have near and dear to my heart. So those are my three because not only the stars they were, but because of my personal connection. Yeah. You know, there's, there's so many great drivers out there. Um, I, I'll try and go down the list from three to one again, but uh, you know, I really liked Dale Earnhardt Jr. Growing up. He was, that was kind of my hero in my younger days growing up. That's, I mean, I had him on the wall everywhere in my room. Um, and then just, then you got to drive for him. Fast forward a couple of years, I end up driving for him. That's crazy. Um, but he was the one I, I mean, like every kid probably my age, cheered, just loved Dale. Um, but I'll actually make it four. Dale, uh, I love three. Tony Stewart. I know, but I'm going to do four. I'm sorry. I just well, thought of another one. I appreciate you coming, so I'll let you. All right, thank you. Um, probably the next one would be Tony Stewart. I mean, his coming from dirt racing, his mentality, how he did things. And he let his personality just fly. He didn't care what anyone thought. And I just love that. I mean, that's that's just the energy he brought to the racetrack and how he raced. And when he made those drives, I mean, everyone just that that play that that chase uh, that he had. When, I think in twenty eleven, right? Right. When he just took like just out of nowhere, took it to everybody. And it started and, at Martinsville. Like, yeah. I, I I was like you. I was I was standing in the in the I was sitting in the grandstands actually watching, and and he made a pass late on the outside and I thought this guy's on a mission and wow you're right um you know I and two I'd say I'd have to go with Tim Richmond um the things he did in a race car how he came into racing he just uh from my understanding he didn't do it that long and then when he picked it up he was really good at it um the only guy that I could think of that is kind of similar in that aspect is probably William Byron as of late um William's obviously still really young for sure so who knows what the future holds for him but the things Tim did in a race car, how he went about it, he just had fun. He was su- supremely talented race car driver. He could yeah. just do things people couldn't at the time. And my number one is Dale Earnhardt, um, just because the way he raced. I think, you know, he he was a dominator, right? But I think he was so ahead of his time and how he raced people and how smart he was. Uh, I I love watching the the Winston where you know he's battling. You know, he's battling uh, Bill Elliott and, and the things he was doing and the way he was racing, you know, back then he's like, man, he's crazy. What is he doing? But you, you think the way our cars race now and what he was doing with his car, he knew – I think he knew how to race, you know, the cars before cars to another level before anyone else could. And yeah. I think that's why he was so good at the plate race tracks. I think that's why he was so good that day. He knew exactly what he had to do, and he, he didn't care what it took. He was going to win that race and put right. on a show. So – what about when uh, – did you see him clean his windshield at Richmond that time? Oh, my time? gosh. How cool is that, that? That is something else, too. I mean, <laughs> he just took things to the next level. I mean, he just – his story. And, you know, uh, the reason I think he's number one for me now is because I've been around Richard Schultz racing a little bit. You know, I get, oh, and you're getting I've a been, sense of the history. See, yes, I've been in the museum. I've seen That's some awesome. of the stuff. You know, I, I know the people – I've gotten to know people better that, that knew him really well. You know, Petrie knew him well. I got to meet Kirk. I got to meet 
uh, you know, I know Larry McReynolds pretty well. You know, Chocolate talks about him. Danny Lawrence knew him really well. Uh, Richard knew him well. And getting to know those people better and hear his story more is really like – I always liked Dale Earnhardt. I really thought he was an incredible driver. But getting to know the people around him more and hear the stories, you know, and even the stories from Schrader and and Wallace and those guys, it's made, uh, you know, it's, it's elevated him in my list for sure, just no hearing doubt. how the guy was. And I'm uh, sure you know as well, obviously. Yeah, I'll tell you my a fun, one funny Dale Earnhardt story. So I, I have on these glasses, and we were in his office late 2000. It was around Christmas time. Uh, we were we we'd spent so many wonderful days and and weeks together talking about me getting an opportunity to drive his car and we're going to Daytona we we've, we've been testing we've been really good in tests fast everywhere we went and he's sitting there signing some checks or reading some contracts at his at his desk and he's got these glasses on and he's writing and I'm there with him I'm his buddy he doesn't give a shit about me and uh some <laughs> this guy walks in the door one of the one of the PR guys I think came in the door uh, and and he said, Dale, I need to see if you can sign this. And Dale, Dale was doing this. And he looked up over these glasses and he said, if you tell anybody I wear glasses, I'll f-ing kill you. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy said, I'll come back later. <laughs> <laughs> so it, he, he was just such a, it, it's such a great man. And I'm yeah. so thankful that at the age of 23 and because of your opportunity at Richard Childress Racing, you're getting to know more about you know, an American hero. That's yeah. awesome. It's cool to, I mean, we all, we've all heard all the stories they put them out on, you know, the TV, the documentaries, all that stuff. But getting to hear like the behind the scenes stories yeah. and get to know more about him from the people that were close with him um, is just so cool. And get to drive for the team that, that, you know, he once spearheaded for so many years and brought to the level that they're at today. It's a incredible time to be driving for Richard Childress Racing for sure. He's a special man. We just finished and, and, showed a private industry screening of a documentary that that I did about my relationship with Dale and it's based based off my life and and our history together and um it, it's 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 really well done and and uh, it's it's going to be coming out in the fall so can't wait for you to see all that right. it'll add to I'll your be, I'll be I'm added to the list of things I need to see all right my last game and then I'll let you go um I actually have two games. That's all right. We can do two. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, Waltrip, Waltrip Word Association. Uh-oh. I say a word. You tell me what you think of. Respect. I have to say it in one word or I can give no, an explanation. You, give an... you know, I think when I think of respect, I think of, you know, how do you want drivers to think of you in the, in the garage area? How do you want to be known as? Do you want to be known as the guy that just races everybody the wrong way and doesn't have fun or just – rude about it do you want to be that or do you want to be that guy that that people know that you're going to have fun racing them you're going to be as fair as you can but you're going to do whatever it takes but do it as right as you can to get to victory lane and you know respect is is big for me uh there's some drivers in the garage that i don't have respect for but there are a lot of really good drivers i have a lot of respect for um and i have an absolute blast racing with you know i've i've had the, because the way this year is kind of shaken out is everyone's kind of seen christopher and cole and i have had a lot of opportunities to race against each other a lot this year um, and Cole and Christopher do a great job. We, you know, there's times where we have to push our limits and we understand that and it goes too far, but you know, I feel like we've done a really good job so far this year of showing a lot of respect to each other. Yeah. We'll dice it up like in Vegas, me and Christopher were throwing sliders, wrecking each other on the back straight away, but it wasn't out of, you know, we weren't mad at each other doing it. We were just out there not only having fun, but you know, we were, we were letting each other go to our absolute most and right. not taking it that step too far where it ends. You know, that's what I think of. Awesome. Larson. Just, you know, when uh, God was making him, he took a dash of <laughs> of uh, badass race car driver and dumped the whole bucket in there. Um, <laughs> man, he does things that you just can't think are possible in race cars. And he's proven it again and again and again, and he will continue to do that. And, you know... I knew he was good when I grew up racing against him. I was a little bit younger than he was, but he was just so good in Outlaw Kart. And, you know, when I saw him get an open wheel and do his things in, in the sprint cars, it seemed like he had a little bit of a lull. I could just be wrong and just wasn't seeing as much of it anymore. Um, but when he finally found it, it caught everybody by surprise, except me. I knew he can do it. And when, you know, I think he still, even though he's won the All-Star and 
you know, he's shown speed at times. They're still not where they want to be. And I feel like if, when they get that team where he needs it to be and they get everything in the right spot, what he did, you know, a year or two ago at the two-mile tracks, he can do it anywhere. Yeah. And I think once once he finally finds it, there's going to be a lot of people that are in trouble. He's just absolutely outstanding driver. You know what? I, I love his talent behind the wheel, but I just wished everybody knew him as a person. Yeah. He's such a good dude. And he's funny as funny as crap. I mean, he comes up with some funny stuff. Yeah. And I just wish more people knew that side of him. Okay, I'm going to let you go with two of those. And then my my final game is – and this perspective I'm really interested in hearing because I've, I've heard you talk about Richard Childress Racing, but in the history of NASCAR, and it can go back to when they were racing on the beach or it can start as recently as this year, but what are your favorite three moments in, in the history of NASCAR? Want to hear mine? I, I love to hear yours, yeah. yeah. I don't want to say the same ones you might. So. Um, 1979, the fight. Mm-hmm. That's a big one. Because I was standing, I was standing on the fence in turn three, and I, Dale and Kale and Bobby went by, and they they go get the white, and my brother and Richard Petty about twenty thirty seconds later they come by, and and Richard Petty's leading my brother, and then I stand there for it seemed like forever, and those three never those two never <laughs> came back. <laughs> That's crazy, ain't it? And then you I'm sit like, there just waiting. I'm like, oh man, this is gonna be. You know, over. I couldn't look. Go? On, I couldn't look on my phone. <laughs> no, we didn't have phones back then. I wasn't even around back then, honestly. And then, and then the fight breaks out. So uh, that's pretty. That's pretty good. A really fun memory for me. And then, 2001, when we returned to Daytona after the tragic events of of the Daytona 500 that year, standing on those car on the car, hugging Dale Jr. and not one person had left. The stands were full, yeah. and we were doing our donuts. I could hear them over my car. It was crazy. And then we got on the cars and hugged, and and Dale Jr. said, love you, bro, and I said, I love you, and he dove off into the crew and crowd surfed off. I'm like, this, this, is, this is as good as could ever be, and I didn't even win. It's my favorite victory celebration, but I think in my mind, one of the one of the best moments in NASCAR. And then Jimmy winning his seventh in Miami a few years back because, you know, it, it brought up more talk about two of my heroes, Richard and Dale, you know, Jimmy joining them. And so that, that was – those are my three. Yeah. I, it's going to be hard for me to put my three in order, but um, – oh, geez, it's just out of the top of my head. I hate it when that happens. I thought about it too much and it almost <laughs> escaped me. Um, and by oh, the way, how did you drink four of these? I've had, uh, I might have had a half, and I I can I didn't know them. really what twisted tea meant until just now. I can put them down probably <laughs> faster than I should. Um, they're not too bad shotgun either. A little bit, a little, a little sweet, but I mean, yeah. they taste really, really good. Yeah, I'm um, having a good morning. Man, I just had it on top of my head. Um, uh, probably the three for me, not in any order, um, but we all remember. 2001 and you know not not just Steve Park's victory at Rockingham I believe right but the one that did it for me was watching Kevin Harvick go to victory lane at Atlanta and the way he won that race and how close he almost didn't win that race but he did for me that's I I still go back and watch that replay and it's still like you know it gives you the chills it gives you that feeling that it there's an emotional connection there and I still go back and watch that race and I see highlights like that pop up on Twitter or, or any of those accounts that the NASCAR nostalgia. Um, that moment is one that always hits home. It's not I wouldn't say it's a happy I mean it's a happy moment for some, but yeah. it's also it's it's it rips you apart. Um and just watching him go to victory lane and win that race for those guys um meant a lot to me. So that's one of them for me. Another one um would be Brad Kozlowski winning at Talladega and the way he won it. For the team he won with, right? The way that was probably the last real upset win, wasn't it? Yeah, I, I for think a so. team, yeah. And I just love that, um, you know, the way he went about. I mean, he had to work really hard. I this was before I was even in NASCAR, really, but I kind of knew about him and his path and race for Junior and him try, scraping his way to get to every opportunity he had. And to watch him win that race the way he did, um. You know, he's just, he's a really smart plate racer. Yeah. And at the time, people just probably thought he got lucky, but 
as we've we've come to know now, he's really, really good at it. And to watch him win that race, I, it was kind of a scary moment with Carl wrecking. Um, but to watch him win that race, that for me is a is a really is a moment I really enjoyed in history. Um, but after that, you know, probably one of my absolute favorites. We kind of already talked about it. Is um, you know Dale Earnhardt winning the Winston the way he did? Mm-hmm. Um, that drive as we've talked about already is just yeah. incredible. I go back and watch. I just can't believe he's he's doing the things he does with a race car. Um, Bill Bill Elliott couldn't believe it either. Oh, Bill was pissed, but you know what? He he's gonna have to get over it. Dale was sopping. Probably, Dale probably sopping some of his tears with the one million of those dollars that he got. So yeah. absolute well, cool experience. Well, it's been a cool experience having you here with me today. Thank you so much. Um, We've hung out a bit, but I really didn't know your spirit and your energy, and it just means a lot to me, your appreciation for the history of the sport and and also how how it's going to be watching you race forward for, for many years to come. So thank you for coming by. Absolutely. I'm no historian, but as I've gone further and further down the road, I learned more and more about NASCAR, and uh, it's truly an incredible sport. It is that. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Well, now that was a lot of fun, man. I love, man, I'm so thankful to Fox Sports. So thankful for the folks that have downloaded their favorite, um, through their favorite podcast app and added Waltrip Unfiltered to, uh, to their listing collection because I am having the best time ever getting to know these, these young racers. Sure, I had Denny Hamlin and Joey Logano and a lot of, wins in the cup series obviously but the stories of the guys that are fighting to get to the cup series and and um, just just how they have progressed in their career at such a young age it's really interesting to me so thank you Tyler Reddick for coming by thank you for for uh, brightening up my morning and thank you guys for listening I appreciate that very much and we'll be back next week with another awesome guest and we're going to have more fun on Waltrip Unfiltered